Good evening. Yes. Good evening. Check, check. There we go. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, kids upstairs, the, the youth and the, I think everybody's upstairs by now. And, uh, but I appreciate you taking time out of your busy week to, to uh, spend some time in Bible study with us. And uh, this is part 21. Can you believe it? We began back on Janu uh, January the 4th, and we're, uh, we're the first, this is the first Wednesday in June, and so we're going to keep plowing until we, until we break, uh, break, break, break through. Amen? How many know that uh, breakthrough is what it's all about? At some point in time, you've got to get through what you're trying to get through, and that's what they call breakthrough. And breakthrough is when uh, the reality of your new creation status in Christ kicks in and you recognize that Jesus, not only has he set you free, but he keeps you free and, uh, and freer. I thank God for the, for, the, for, the, for the word of God, don't you? Because every, every advance that we make and every, um, every level of maturity that we're able to achieve is only because of grace and because God's word uh, leads us from glory to glory. Let's pray tonight and ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Father, we're so grateful to be together as a family. We thank you for the power of your word. There's nothing in the universe like it. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that your word is what quickens us, awakens us, saves us, sanctifies us, and secures us for our eternal future. And Lord, tonight we ask you, Lord, if it, whatever hindrances may be um, hanging on to us, Father, we, we, we come to you tonight as, as your children asking you, Lord, break every chain. Break every chain. Say it with me break every chain. Father, you heard our voices. It's a record in heaven now. We want, we want every chain, every limitation, everything that binds us to our past or tries to bind us to our past and limit us in our experience of salvation. Father, break it. Reveal it and break it in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up the students upstairs in Austin Youth. We lift up the teachers and students upstairs with the, the, from, from kindergarten age through six. We pray tonight, Lord, that every teacher, Lord, anoint their lips and give them grace and favor in the words they speak. Lord, let them be ambassadors of life to every child that they speak to, Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Um, come on in, brother. Uh, I, uh, I asked uh, uh, Liana tonight, uh, you know, she's, she really is a miracle. And if you know anything about her, you know that she's an absolute miracle. And, uh, but I, I'm fascinated with her uh, pursuit of truth. And when somebody, you know, a lot of people are on the premises. You know what I'm talking about? They're present. But some people are just like, a, like throwing a dog to a bone and just rabid, just going, not liking, liking you to a dog. But uh, anyway, I want her to, this, this book, uh, and I'm not peddling the book, but I do want to tell you about it. Um, I got it several weeks ago. They're ten dollars a piece, no profit. That's that's my cost. And anyway, um, they breaking the strongholds of iniquity. And the component in this book that mattered to me the most is is the legal aspect. And that's what I wanted her to talk a little bit about because she mentioned this to me, and I'm like, she's actually reading it. And so, Liana, would you come up? It, they're right here. There's. They're right here. I've got, I've got several of them. I think there's eight or nine right here. It's called Breaking the Strongholds of Iniquity. Okay, well, uh, am, I, am I doing so well? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I would like to first say that I get very nervous speaking in front of crowds, so if I repeat myself or stutter, just bear with me. Um, I did. I am work, currently working through this book. Um, I stumbled across chapter 4, which is about the power of our tongue. Um, and initially, words were created for releasing spiritual power. Um, the tongue has the power of death and life, and those who love it will eat its fruit. That's Proverbs 18.21. Um, and I actually texted Pastor about this chapter because uh, for a while now, I mean, but Really, a couple of months ago, it really hit me that, has anyone ever said to you, don't speak that into existence? You know, and they're, everyone said that to me. My husband, my mother-in-law, and I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, it didn't, it didn't really 
register, so um, I was just praying, and I was like, God, just let me speak positivity into the world. Let me, you know, I don't, I don't want to be one of those negative Nancys that are just bitter and horrid and, you know. And so I had already asked Pastor to pray for me to be able to learn to shut my mouth because that's a problem that I have. And so I can admit that. <clears throat> but then I stumbled across this chapter, and I realized that we have, we have to, we must learn to control our tongues. It is literally, it can speak wildfire. It, you can curse yourself, your family, people you know, not even realizing that you're doing it. Um, and words are powerful and legal. And if you're reading this book, if you're not, I would recommend it. Even, I think everyone should. But they're legal. The adversary is always listening to every single word that we speak. Every one of them. Why is he doing that? Because he can use our words against us in a legal manner in the courts of heaven. There's court, courts in heaven. So, <clears throat> Matthew 37, For by your words you will be justified and acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. So, <clears throat> the author of this book explained it in a way that, I mean, it says it right there in Matthew 37. Our words can be used against us legally in the courts of heaven. They can acquit us. They can condemn us. Um, so we have to be very careful of what we say. Uh, the adversary knows in order to enforce something, he must like a, make a legal claim against us within the courts of heaven. God cannot deny iniquity. If we've said it, if we've spoke it, and the adversary's heard it, he can't deny that. Um, and then we can, you know, we can be diagnosed with disease. Um, that's disease on a Christian is something that can come from iniquity and, and a claim that was undeniable in the courts of heaven. Um, it's something legal that allowed the curse to begin in the first place. It's something legal that allows it to stay and prevents us from getting our healing. Proverbs 26, 2 like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow. So a curse without a call shall not be upright. So um, I don't know if I'm processing all this correctly, but hopefully it's all making sense. Um, but what I've really taken from this chapter is that our words are so powerful, more powerful than we even probably care to admit to ourselves because it's easy to, oh, this sucks, and this is so hard, and this is never going to work. I find myself doing it more often than I care to admit. But if we just take the time to talk to God, pray about it, just shut your mouth, open your heart, open your mind, and trust that he's got it, everything will be fine. He always works it out. But we cannot allow our mouths to cause the adversary to have a claim against us, ever. So... Y'all pray for me about it, and I'll pray for you about it. The, uh, you know, a lot of people don't recognize. My wife is the first one that ever to told me about uh, Power of Addiction 21. And, uh, and, and we, I didn't realize and didn't believe that the adversary could do anything in my life, but I recognized my mouth opened doors that I did not want to open in my life. And so that's, that's again, the power of life and death, or death and life, is actually how it reads in, in Proverbs, is in our tongue. And so uh, I, the song that, that we shared, uh, or that, that Juan sang last month at, at our uh, night of prayer, uh, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. Say it with me. I plead the blood. Father, you, you have given us access to the greatest power in the world. Nothing is stronger, nothing is greater, nothing is mightier than the blood of Jesus. And Father, tonight we plead that blood of Jesus over our families, over our bodies. Father, for those of us that are, that, that are fighting some affliction, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you the blood of Jesus is strong enough. It, it broke the curse of sickness and darkness. And Father, we, we ask you in the name of Jesus, help us to speak in alignment with your word. In Jesus' name. Father, we pray for a man that was, um, that Terry mentioned to me a few moments ago. We pray for a man that was found unresponsive, uh, possibly due to a drug overdose. And 
uh, whether he would live or not is, was not known. We don't know who this man is. We don't know his name, anything about him. But, Father, we lift him up to you. And we pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you'd have mercy, that you'd save his life. And, Father, open his eyes to your presence and your person. Lord, help him to do, help him what you, to do what you've done for us, and that is to cause us to fall in love with you. And, Father, that will change his life and alter his destiny. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Part 21. Uh, you can follow along on the notes if you'd like or on the screen. We are confident that God is able to orchestrate everything. Somebody say everything. everything. Say it like you mean it. Everything. everything to work towards something good and beautiful when we love him and accept his invitation to live according to his plan. From the distant past, his eternal love reached into the future. You see, he knew those who would be his one day. And he chose them beforehand to be conformed to the image of his son so that Jesus would be the firstborn of a new family of believers, all brothers and sisters. As for those he chose beforehand, he called them to a different destiny so that they would experience what it means to be made right with God and share in his glory. So this, uh, we are in the last, there's two parts on seducing spirits. Last week was the first part. Tonight we'll wrap this up. And, uh, we shared last week, I'm just hitting the high points and we'll move forward really quickly here. The, uh, the symptoms of this spirit being enacted in our life or having force or authority in our lives, hypocrisy, uh, and that is defined as most concerned with perception by or the approval of others. How many know that's a ditch that you don't want to fall into? Amen. Uh, deception, uh, willing to, being willing to stretch the truth that will uh, benefit me or mine. Uh, that's also a demonic uh, uh, outcome. Easily deceived, and uh, this may be of all these symptoms the most the most uh, dangerous, because many of us we've made ourselves gullible. We want others' approval so badly we will listen to things and agree to things that we have no business. Can I get an amen somewhere? And so that's that's something we we must be on guard about. Uh, spiritual gypsy or vagabond, endlessly searching for new truths. This is extremely dangerous because there, uh, of so-called new truths, there is no end. Um, we'll travel any distance to hear a new word or a now word. Those terms scare me, and I'll tell you why later on. Uh, fascination with evil ways, objects, or persons. Attracted to secret knowledge. There was a book that came out years ago. I can't remember the lady's name, but the book was called The Secret. Does anybody remember that book? And uh, it was written by a New Age um, uh, personality and, and, and what she shared, I, I, I bought the book because someone uh, recommended it to me and I, buy, I bought it because I knew I, want, I wanted to get, I wanted to be on the same page where this person was going to ask me questions. And what this lady said was, uh, you know, about all these, uh, uh, these, these things and, you know, it goes back to the, she, she named three or four Egyptian and whatever back in the dark ages and all this. And so the thing that I remember was, um, if God's word is not sufficient, then we don't have any hope. Amen? The word of God answers every claim. Can I get a witness someplace? And so, T Timothy says, uh, this is from the Living Bible in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4, but the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some in the church will turn away from Christ and become eager followers of teachers with devil-inspired ideas. These teachers will tell lies with straight faces and do it so often that their consciences won't even bother them. Verses 11 through 13 in chapter 4. Teach these things, Paul uh, tells his spiritual son. Teach these things and make sure everyone learns them well. Don't let anyone think little of you because you are young. Be their ideal. Let them follow the way you teach and live. Say the last two words there. And live. How many understand your words are important, but your, but, but your model is more important. In other words, what, what we're supposed to be imitators of Christ. And Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And so uh, you, may not, you may never realize how many people are watching you and taking their cues from you. Not putting pressure on you. I'm just saying that we truly are, as, as, uh, as Paul said in, in another place, living letters or living epistles known and read of all men. Um, be their ideal. Let them follow the way you teach and live. Be a pattern for them in your love, your faith, and your clean thoughts. Until I get there, read and explain the scriptures to the church. Preach God's word. Verse 14, be sure to use the abilities 
God has given you through his prophets when the elders of the church laid their hands upon your head. Put these abilities to work. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone may notice your improvement and progress. Read this last verse with me, please. Verse 16. Keep a close watch on all you do and think. Stay true to what is right, and God will bless you and use you to help others. So when we talk about seducing spirits, what does the word seduce mean? Here are some definitions. Uh, actually, it's one definition in varied parts from the uh, Greek uh, dictionary, um, reference dictionary. Apoplonio is the, the, is the Greek uh, word, actually is a term. It means to lead astray, to roam, to cause to wander away from the truth, to lead into error, to deceive, to be led aside from the path of virtue, to sever or to fall away from the truth. Who wants you to fall away from the truth? Satan. Satan. He is our first and last enemy. Actually, the last enemy is death, but, uh, but Satan's goal is to get us to that point without Jesus. Um, and so that, that's the reason, if you have your Bible there, just, just pick, it up, pick it up for just a second. I'm going to say this to you as your brother in Christ. If it does not originate here, then you need to check the origin. You need to check the source. If it's not originating in the word, there's a lot of people who have a lot of ideas. And sometimes because it doesn't, it doesn't exactly sound like something we've heard before, we may become anim have some level of animosity against it. But Paul said, test all things. Hold fast what is true. So it's, it's okay to hear things, but... We need to make certain that we can prove it in Scripture and that we have a scriptural basis for our uh, beliefs and for our uh, positions. Um, Brian Chappelle said this. He said, the church's greatest mistakes, and this is so true, the church's greatest mistakes occur when the people of God honor what a leader says without examining that instruction in the light of Scripture. And that's the reason why your Bible is your best friend. And that's the reason why you want to be on the, on the first name basis with the Holy Spirit because he's the one who teaches us and illuminates the truth. Can I get an amen someplace? Um, Paul says to the church in Ephesus, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship. Say it with me. No, let's read that verse together. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Keep going. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. Whatever makes manifest is light. So we are to have nothing to do with the deeds of darkness. You know, I, I try to remind myself that, pre that preferences and uh, opinions about things are are completely personal. Can I get an amen? And so I don't want to I don't want to condemn something that the scripture does not condemn. And so while I personally would not, I would not watch a scary movie, so to say, or anything like that, I know that's not exactly. It, there's nothing in the Bible that says don't do that. But when I read the verse that says have nothing to do with the works of darkness, that reminds me, amen. And so I don't want to see how close I can get to the line. So. I don't want to give the enemy any, any leeway. I don't want to give him any line that he can, oh, that's all I needed, just a thread, and, and just begin to work and, and to pull me towards something uh, that, that I don't have any business uh, doing. I, don't want to get, I want to get as close to Jesus as I possibly can on this side of heaven. Don't you? And, uh, and, and so when we talk about this, this, this thing of seducing spirits, you, you have to have a, a, staff, a staff gauge. You've got you to have a measuring line. What is true? I want to say this to you as your brother in Christ because I love you with all my heart and I want to do everything I can in my power to help you. God's word is not for scholars. Who did Jesus choose to be his disciples? Kids. Young men. Fishermen. They were not learned in the scriptures. Jesus took some novices and poured his life into them and said, follow me and do what I do. And so it's the educational level is not, is not the issue. The issue is, are you teachable? Say it with me. Are you teachable? Can you be teachable? And many, many times, the greatest enemy of revelation is believing that you already have all the revelation you need. 
And so God is always in the process. I've been saved almost 39 years, and I'm so thankful. I, I began with a confession of faith. And Bob, if I died at that moment, I'd have, I'd, have, I'd have busted heaven wide open. Hallelujah. But God left me here so I could grow in grace and knowledge and so I could, could help some people. And so let me, let me talk to you about discerning the spirits. Now, last week we had uh, Dixie and Daniel and Diane share with us a few minutes about that. And I want to say to you with all my heart, I don't know of anything, any gift in the church that is more necessary in this moment than discerning the spirits. And this is what Dr. Lester Summerall said many years ago. I should have changed the, the death date up there. That was wrong. It, it was 1997. Anyway, he said, The discerning of spirits is the divine ability to see the presence and activity of a spirit that motivates a human being, whether good or bad. Now, that doesn't mean that every time that you walk up on somebody, you, you're, trying to, you're, you're, you know, you're trying to figure something. No, no, no. You, you, if, you, if you try to do that, you'll go crazy. Amen? And, uh, and so God will alert you. How many know what I'm talking about? God, if, you're, if you're in an in, in a, in a, in a, a area or in a, a, a place, whatever, where the enemy's activities are going on, you will know it immediately. You don't have to say, let me call Pastor Lynn and see what he thinks. No, no. You got a, your spirit man will set an set a, a alarm off. Can I get an amen? And so we have to understand this that because we live in a multicultural society, a pluralistic society, uh, listen, Corinth has nothing on us. Uh, I used to, we used to read the, the stories of, uh, in, in, in uh, Bible dictionaries and uh, about Ephesus and, and all these places and the debauchery and hedonism and just vulgarity and filth, and I'm thinking, Lord, how could those people survive that? We're living right in it now. Hello. And so how many know that what goes around comes around? And, and uh, so this, this is what we're dealing with today. And that, this is why not just personally when you, in the spaces you go into, but also that box that you and I turn on, we click with, with a, a selector and we've got a thousand channels we can look at. Those voices are releasing something into your atmosphere. Pastor Lynn, please. That's, that's a box with images on it. If you hear it, it can stick. If you see it, it can stick. And so, guard the eye gate. Go ahead and do it with me. We used to tell our kids this. I'm not trying to treat you like my kids, but I'm just, we, said, we would tell them, guard the eye gate and guard the ear gate. You don't lend your ears to everything that comes down the path. Can somebody say amen? So, let's talk about for a few minutes the spirit of Antichrist. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. This is so critical right now. If I could focus on one thing the rest of the night, I would focus on just this one part right here. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Say it with me. Do not believe every spirit. Now, most of us have, if you've been saved for very long, you, you, you get that, do you not? You understand that. But if you're young in the Lord and you maybe you're not as... Uh, conditioned uh, by our relationships in the body of Christ and I mean I, th I thank God but between uh, Diane obviously she knew Jesus before I did and I don't, still don't know why she married a pagan I'm just glad she did but, uh, but, but the people that I was, I was exposed to when I first got saved Bob they, they it was like I guess they could see the hunger in my, in, on me and in me and they took me under their wing Tom Plant Brother Gordon Howard and so many others that just they just uh, Pat Fagley and and so many others that just basically just adopted me, and they became my spiritual mothers and, and fathers. And I'm so grateful for that because they taught me. Listen, when you walk into a church, the first time you've ever been in there, and somebody says, you raise your hand if you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you raise your hand, you pray the sinner's prayer, and you go back out there. If you stay out, if, if you're by yourself, you, you just walked out to a pack of wolves. And so that's why we're supposed, we're supposed to, uh, we're supposed to look, look out and guard one another. Amen? Because there are many spirits. Let's go. Let's keep going here. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Keep going with me. Let's read it. Whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Wow. Now, this is written in, in the first century. We're, way, we're a long way down the road. 
this verse is as pertinent and as relevant today in our culture as it was when it was written. Thank God for the Bible. Amen? By this, verse 2, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So the Antichrist, or the spirit of the Antichrist, was, was already, it was, it was, he had made his entrance, if you will, in the first century, and that spirit is still in, alive in the world today. He reminds them in verse number four, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Read, the, read that next line with me, ready? Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. One more time out loud. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Let that sink in, saints. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So it... If I could give you one assignment in, in, in for the rest of your days on the, on the earth, I would say this. Learn the art or the spiritual gift of discerning the spirits. You have to understand when something, because if we live in a sight and sound world, do we not? And there's, there's something, again, that the box, that box that speaks to us. They're not just inert words. No, every word has power. I said every word has power. And so when we hear those words, we have to distinguish and discern uh, the 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 uh, the, or, the source or origin of those words, and um, and because we are creatures of eternity, now our bodies are in the process of dying. I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I know you love your body the way it is. Personally, I could I can say this without without fear of of of, uh, of rebuttal or, or repercussions. When I trade this body in, I'm going to get an upgrade. I'm telling you right now. Amen. And so, anyway, and, uh, and so, but until that moment comes, God has left us here because who is salt and light in the earth? You are. How many have lost loved ones, family members, maybe brothers, sisters? Is anything in the world scarier? If you're, if, you're, if, if you're of the same spirit I, I am of, I'm like this, Lord, I'm ready to go today. But as long as you give me life and breath, I'm going to be pleading in the blood and interceding for my family. I've got brothers that are lost. I've got a sister that's lost. I've got a father that's lost. I've got loved ones who don't know Jesus. So I'm going to be on this planet and in the flesh praying for them in the spirit until it's time to go. Don't you want to pray for your loved ones? Hey, before we do anything else, how many have lost loved ones? Father, you see every hand that's in this room that is up. And that means that if the trumpet sounded in the next five minutes, we would leave behind loved ones who do not know you. And Father, that hurts our hearts. We're so grateful that you've redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb. And Father, we lift up our family members, those who are in darkness, those who have been deceived, those who have believed a lie, and they're perishing. Father, do for them what you did for us. Open their eyes and quicken their hearts. And God calls them to do what you did for us, to fall madly in love with Jesus and to begin to pursue you with all our hearts, soul, mind, and strength. Father, we, we give them to you right now in the name of Jesus. We give them to you in the name of Jesus. Father, if the trumpet did sound while we're praying, Father, we ask you that those who are left behind, Father, that the words we speak and the example that we set, God, that you would use that as a testimony to the power and the love and grace of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Paul reminded the church in, uh, when he wrote his spiritual son Timothy, he said, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Notice this, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Much of what is going on in the church nowadays 
is smoke and mirrors. It's very sad, and it's very frightening. We would rather impress people and build empires, religious empires, that, uh, that someone could let the feet of a, a, a charismatic leader or, or, or group or whatever. That's bull. That's bull hockey is what that is. What matters is it's not, it doesn't matter how many people are in the building or how glitzy and glamour the stadium or the, or the room or the building or the whatever may, what matters is what are you hearing? Because the adversary will be happy to accommodate you if you have itching ears. Tell me something new. I want to hear a new truth. I want to hear a new word. No, 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 no. The, old, the good old gospel is the only thing that you need. Can I get an amen somewhere? And so we have to be diligent. We have to protect ourselves. We cannot expose ourselves. When someone says, hey, I've got a tape for you. They don't do those anymore, or CDs. But anyway, I want you to hear, here's a link. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, text you a, 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 a link to a, what are those things, those things called? Not a link, but you, you know, yeah, whatever. Anyway, and you click it, and it takes you to, you, you know what I'm saying. Okay, I'm not as tech savvy as I need to be. But anyhow, uh, be ca- before you click and it takes you to another landing page and you begin to listen to somebody, within about two minutes you can, dis- you can discern, is this guy or gal, is, are they legit or is this some weirdo trying to, some snake oil salesman in a, in a three-piece suit? Amen? Listen, discernment in the body of Christ. I'm sorry to say this. Discernment, especially in the American church, is at an all-time low. Anything goes. Okay, so let's talk to you. Let's talk for a few moments about examples of discerning of spirits in the New Testament. Are y'all interested in this? You want to go further? Okay, good. Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter, good old Peter, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. When I get to heaven, I, want to, I just want to see that tape, don't you? Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, What did he say? Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, what's what's the biggest problem with that statement? Who was Peter's greatest influence? Jesus. Who did he hear? Who did he serve? Who did he follow? Who, who did Jesus send out when he sent out the 70? Peter was among those. So Jesus knew Peter, and Peter knew Jesus. But when it came to this area here, instead of being God's hand or voice of encouragement through Jesus, what he was doing is he was actually laying a trap because he was appealing to his, he was appealing to his own needs and not what God had ordained. Get behind me, Satan. Say it with me one more time. Get behind me, Satan. Now, if Jesus could say that to one of his followers, what did he tell? What, what else did he say after this? He, what did he say about Peter? He said, "He said you are Petros. You are Peter. You're you're the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. So just because you mess up doesn't mean that you can't be used in the kingdom. Amen. And so, so what this is about is Jesus could have been attracted." in a sense, to what Peter said. Oh, no, that's, that's not going to happen to you. I, I, don't, I can't imagine what that rebuke would have sounded like, but I'm sure, I'm sure it wasn't Christ-like. But anyhow, um, it's not going to, Lord, this is not going to happen. And Jesus recognized the source. He did not condemn the man. He condemned the actions of the man because that man gave his mouth to the enemy to use against the adversary. Go ahead and just, just reach up, just dust it off first, make sure it's clean. Put it right here. Would you agree with me that there's times something like what Rihanna said earlier, there's times we just need to be careful and prayerful about what we say. Keep your mouth shut. Brother, Brother Bonner, good man, great man. Say it with me. Keep your mouth 
Yes. Brother Bonner said it. I believe it. Amen. Luke 9. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, Jesus, and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they didn't watch this. He goes to a village. He's in, he's, he's, he's in a village of the Samaritans. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And it was when his disciples, James and John, saw this, in other words, they were not receptive to Jesus. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Now, wouldn't that have been a pretty picture? Verse 55. But Jesus, but he turned and rebuked them and said, read it with me. You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Wow. That's a powerful, powerful rebuke. You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So discernment, even in Christian circles, even among your best friends, you still have to be discerning. Can I get an amen someplace? Okay. John 144. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel. I love this story. And said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus practiced discernment. He saw something in Nathanael that Nathanael did not see in himself. I mean, thankful that he saw something in you that you and I did not see for ourselves. Amen. Acts 13. We doing all right so far? Okay. And when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer. Uh-oh. A false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, or son of Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, somebody. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all, uh, all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. I don't mind saying this to you. In the world we're living in, with so much demonic activity going on, we don't just need the power of being able to discern the atmosphere, but to command spirits. Because when you walk on their, in, the, in the territory where they, are, where, they, where, where they have a stronghold, you and I, we, listen, they have a legal right there. But their legal right does not trump the power of God that's on the inside of us. Because we're on kingdom business. We have to have authority over them. So that's the reason why you don't want anything hanging over your head. You, listen, we do, we, we do not want ever, ever to insult the Holy Spirit or to grieve the Holy Ghost. Can I get an amen? You want, you, you want, to, you want to be cloaked and covered by the Holy Spirit because we, don't, we have no idea what we're going to walk into at any, any time of the day or night. And so thank God that, that the Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit that that, that was active in the first century, that same Holy Spirit is on the inside of you and me. Aren't you thankful for that? Acts 16. Now what happened as he went to prayer that a certain slave girl 
this is interesting, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, watch what she says, and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Does anybody have a problem with that? What she said was right. Was it not? Verse 18, and this she did for many days. Can you imagine what that was like? But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. He didn't talk to her. He talked to the Spirit speaking through her. You see this? Said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Listen, there was a day when, we, when the America that we lived in, woke up in, was a lot safer than it is now. A lot saner than it is now. A lot more Christian than it is now. If we ever needed the power to discern, distinguish, and command spirits, Pastor Graham, are you saying that, I'm saying that if the, if the, there is no junior Holy Ghost, I mean, you either got all of him or you got none of him. And if it's the same Holy Spirit that was in the first century, and he was, he was at, at, at Paul's disposal or, or at Christ's disposal to use, to silence a, a spirit or, or to, to, to cast a spirit out, that same spirit is on the inside of you and me. How many believe that? Father, our hands are raised tonight because we believe your word. We don't believe what we feel. We don't believe what society tells us. And God, we need the same Holy Ghost that the first century church functioned in, were possessed of, were full of, and utilized that power to change their world. God, grant it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Next verse, Acts 18. We're almost done. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. Oh, man, this is bad. This is bad. When Simon saw that through the laying on of, of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Mike, Penny, Michael Penny, I know what you're thinking. Some of that's going on today, isn't it? You want to share about that in a minute? You're welcome to. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay, I, I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, does that seem... I mean, he want, he's trying to transfer or transmit the Holy, Holy Spirit. That's what it sounds like. Okay, but Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift, somebody say gift, the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore, repent therefore of this, this your wickedness and pray God that perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Notice this. He said the right thing. But he did not have the right heart. And the man of God distinguished and discerned that. Would to God today. I, I, if I sound like a broken record, I apologize. I'm just, I'm just being brutally honest with you. I'm very concerned about the lack of discernment in the body. I truly am. We have gotten on board this smile. God loves you, uh, train, and I'm all, I, 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 you know, I'm, a, I'm a lover. That's how, I, that's how I relate. But, but understand this: we have to be responsible. I mean, if God, God put us, how many are thankful for Sand Mountain? If we're going to be effective evangelists in this county and on this mountain, we got, we've got to have the Holy Spirit, or should I say, He's got to have us, because we're going to encounter the very same things. And if we don't recognize what we're dealing with, we, we may agree, agree to things that, are, that God has nothing to do with. You want to share, Michael? You're welcome to. Michael's a deep well. Oh, it's, it's, it, he's probably just trying to, find, trying to figure out which volume to start with. Yeah, yeah well... 
sometimes it's uh, in my role as sometimes as God's loose cannon. It's a very reckless thing to hand me a microphone. But uh, in this situation of money and, and Simon and uh, all that, you know, I think it's rather funny that for many years, Protestants used to criticize Catholics, okay, for what were known as indulgences. In fact, a very famous quote from medieval times was basically that the moment the coin hit the box, basically your prayer was heard and your answer was on the way. See, it was all about buying God's favor. It was about purchasing God's blessing. It was about basically, I, I, I knew a guy, in fact, he, he, was, he was my employer, and he actually understood this principle and he, and he liked it because he was a heathen and, and he was a drunkard and, and a womanizer and all that, but he liked the idea that God could be bought because that was right in his wheelhouse. And it's a terribly ungodly principle. But it's hardly now a Catholic thing. It's a Protestant thing. Because right now, gim, uh, right now we have so much gimmickry. I mean, flat out gimmickry. We have, uh, I'm going to bear it, we have basically specialists in fundraising whose job it is is to come there and figure out ways to part you from your dollar. Now, you know, I believe in giving. In fact, I believe that basically everything we have, God gave us, and none of it is ours, but we are stewards of it all. Because when God got all of me, he got all of what I have, not just all of what I am. And so I believe that anything and everything he wants that I have, as well as what he wants that I am, he can ask for at any time, and it's his. Because the right answer is always, yes, Lord. But I have a major issue with manipulation gimmicks. I remember many years ago, I used to listen to somebody, and their pitch was first fruits offerings. Now, I know that nobody here has ever heard a teaching or a sermon on first fruits offerings. You know, that first check. That first raise, that first bonus, you need to write that check and give it to God because it says that if you give him your first fruits, these are the blessings you're going to get. And it sounds great. And it works great. Otherwise, they wouldn't be teaching and preaching it. But you know, the bad thing about the scripture is it tends to really pigeonhole our gimmicks. Because, you know, it, it, I, I got to thinking about this. Jesus Christ is the first fruits of those who rose from the dead. Jesus Christ came out of the grave on the festival of first fruits and fulfilled the first fruits offering. So if Jesus fulfilled the first fruits offering and I am in him, and he is in me, and in Christ all of the promises are yea and in him, amen. Then when he came out of the grave as the first fruits of those who rose from the dead, every first fruit blessing came out with him. And when he came into my life and I came into following him, I didn't need to offer a first fruits offering because there is no first fruit offering that I could ever offer that Jesus didn't do better on the day he came out of the grave. And all of those blessings are mine. And I don't need anybody to give me a gimmick to write a check 
to get a blessing that I'm already entitled to because Jesus paid the price. Let me tell you something. He wrote a first fruits offering check that ain't nobody going to want up. But what we have today are too many people that are preaching if you drop the check, if you drop the coin, then you'll get your healing. You'll get your deliverance. You'll get your blessing. Let me tell you something. If Jesus hanging on the cross and coming out of the grave didn't buy it, I'm not needing it. And if you're selling it, and I understand, because the thing is, Christians are cheap. Oh, see, I'm, oh, now, now this is where I throw Daniel Knight under the bus. <laughs> Prepare yourself, Daniel. Is it not true that 90% of the giving in church is done by 10% of the people in church? Hence the gimmicks. Hence the gimmicks. But I know this. If God gave his son and his son gave his life and he sent his spirit into me, then I'm going to be a giver without gimmicks. I'm going to be a giver without the expectation of a blessing that I'm already entitled to. I'm going to give because his heart is now my heart. And that's the reason why we give. Not about the getting. It's about the giving. And if we will do that, then we won't have a need for gimmick teachings. And we won't have a need for gimmick teachings, at that point, we will know the price that was fully paid, all that we are entitled to receive, and all that he's worthy for us to give. And on that, I'm just going to shut up. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. The, uh, the sad thing is that that spirit... Uh, and it is very sad. That spirit is alive in, in this generation, and it's, it's very sad. Um, let me, before it's getting late here, I, I want to mention to you what, what you received tonight. One of the things that may not seem relevant, I, I'm, I'm very hesitant to say what I'm about to say because the Lord just, just sat on me today. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I started to call my wife and ask her to pray for me because I don't want to say what I'm going to say tonight. But I know what she would have said. Say it. I just, Pastor Mike, I began to just sense in my spirit so much. I, I, let me just be brutally honest with you. I'm not comfortable teaching Bible prophecy. I've said that to you before because I've heard so much. And I, I can't hold a candle to, I mean, we, we were taught by some of the best ever. And I would not even presume to, I, I don't deserve to stand in their shadow. But recognize, dealing with this thing about seducing spirits and understanding, you know, we're living in the last milliseconds of this age. And we need to know what to expect. We need to know, um, I, I'm, what I'm saying is this, I'm obligating myself. I, I'm not sure, I, I won't do it near as de in-depth a, a job as, as Michael or, or Dan Wilmoth would do. But I want to deal with some of these things because it's impossible to share these principles and truths without dealing with what, where we're going. And so these seducing spirits, there's an article in, 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 uh, in the handouts tonight uh, written by Desiree Mondesir, and, and it's, it's a very, very powerful article. And uh, I got permission uh, from her to, to uh, distribute this to you. There's also an article called Tracing the Mystery of Iniquity, 
this is very, very powerful, and, uh, and, and this, this spirit is uh, alive and well in our age. And then this, is, this information here was taken from the Dake's, uh, Dake Annotated Reference Bible, and it's on uh, the two events that precede the day of the Lord. And this is why I want to share this with you, because recognizing where we are and what is coming, um, you'll notice there that the, that the references are to the falling away and to the man of sin or the son of perdition being revealed. And so the next thing that, that I mean, I, I believe this, and I could be, I, I could be wrong. I believe everything that needed to, needs to be fulfilled, needs to be done, has already been done. And so at this, at this point, we're on God's good grace, are we not? Jesus could come back at any moment. We're asking him, how many have loved ones? That, that we're, you know the reason why has, Jesus has not come back yet? Because you and I, our, our prayers for our loved ones, he's giving them space and time to repent. Hallelujah, somebody. And so, but these, 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 uh, these two things, these two events, the falling away, the apostasy, and what we're seeing right now, what Michael just, was just referenced about the gimmickry and the, and the pitch and promotions that happens in church sometimes, it's an absolute shame because Jesus never begged for a dime. Can I get an amen somewhere, in place? Why? Because he had resources. His father took care of him. If the church would just simply do, preach the gospel, I mean, understand that God takes care of everything you need if you put him first. And so these two events, and you're going to see there's a, a, a slide on here about the day of the Lord uh, that is written about in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And, 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 and if you can, I apologize if you can't see it that well on, your, on the slide, but I want you to understand something. The only thing, if you have your Bible there with you, real quick, just flip over to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 7, and mark this place in your Bible because you're going to be coming back to it. Second Thessalonians 2. Verse number seven. Actually, if you if you have a, uh, if you have a New King James Bible, it's very possible that you have a a uh, a, a, a title or a introduction over the first verse of chapter two that says the great apostasy. Does anybody see that in their Bible beside me? Great apostasy. Okay. Let me just let me just read this uh, this passage right here. You okay with that? I, I'm I'm fixing to be done. Verse 1, now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us. Notice that. There's people that were, that were imposters that were trying to scare people in the first century. Uh, by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Read verse 3 with me, please. Ready? Let no one deceive you by any means. Stop right there. Let no one deceive you by any means. Okay, so if the first century church had to be on guard, where should we be? We're closer than they were. Okay, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless, what? The falling away, apostasia, the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God, this is profane, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So um, let, let me keep going. I, I, could, I could go off track. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? In verse 6, and now you know what is restraining. Somebody say restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he, somebody say he, until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And so what I'm going to give you next week, you, 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 can, uh, uh, you can have, I've got a couple, of, well, you've got, you got this, this there in your handout, read it this week. Study it, don't just read it, study it this week. Mark your Bible this week. You recognize this. There's only three things that could be standing in the way. The last one is the right one, the church. 
why does the adversary fight us tooth and nail and hate us? Why are we hated and, and oppressed by society like we've never been in America? Because we are the last, we're that last thread before Jesus comes back. And so, listen, stand with me, please. I want to encourage you, your brother in Christ. Pastor, I don't know how to witness to somebody. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. How many have a testimony? Hallelujah. You know what? Somebody might can argue a chapter and verse of the Bible with you. They can. There's a lot of people out there that know it better than I do. How about you? But they cannot contradict your story. So tell your story. Tell them, uh, tell, tell, your, tell your, your family members and, and your loved ones and your coworkers and, and your neighbors, tell them what Jesus has done for you. There will be a last, I heard this, Pastor Mark said this back at Cathedral back in the, in the 1990s. He said one day there will be the last testimony. And then the trumpet will sound. And I remember thinking at that moment in time, Dixie, all those years back, Lord, tonight, here we are 24 years later, we're still here because Jesus is so gracious. Why don't you thank for Reach over and take the hand beside you. Would you do it? Come here, Mary. Let's get in the middle right here. Father, we lift up our families to you. Our co-workers. Our neighbors. Lord, our hearts ache under the weight of the depravity of this world. It literally sickens us to see and to hear much of what is going on in society. It would be so easy to, be, to, to get bitter and act hateful. But Father, you've called us to intercede, to stand in the gap for those who do not know you, for those who are blaspheming your name, and God, tonight we lift up the blood of Jesus over Marshall County, Alabama. God, we pray for a move that will shake this state in Marshall County, Alabama. Father, that every church will see growth as people who once loved darkness, lead darkness, and come to the light. People who once blasphemed the name of Jesus now call that name. Savior, Lord, King, and Redeemer. Father, minister to our families. We don't want a single solitary one to be left behind in this depraved world. And Jesus, thank you that the church is still the restraining agent. The church, you've left the church here to be a light, to be a witness, to be salt in the earth. And, Father, help us to fulfill our responsibilities as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Lord Jesus, live in us. Live through us. And draw others to your heart as you've done us. We give you praise and thank you for your extravagant grace in our lives. We are so thankful to be saved. So thankful to be going to heaven when the trumpet sounds. But, Father, until that moment, let us be diligent prayer warriors intercessors for the lost and the hurting and the broken in our society. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said amen. Amen. Why don't you hug about 44 people before you leave, would you? Thank you.